You know, if you heard that song from Ricky and Anton, I, I'm regularly am amazed at the, the depth of talent we have here at Chapel Street Church and how blessed we are to have so many uh, really remarkably talented and gifted musicians. And by the way, Ricky and Anton have started a little duet uh, com- called The Lost and the Light, and that's one of their original songs. We're so thankful for their gifts and all of our worship teams who lead us so effectively each week. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word, shall we? Father, you are strong enough to take us where we belong, and where we belong is in your presence. And so now we ask that you would speak to us as we come to your word, and you, Lord Jesus, the living word, who surround us at all times, though we're not always aware of it, would speak to us the words we need to hear. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Years ago, when my oldest son, Noah, was younger, I was coaching his flag football team. Actually, it was a seventh grade tackle football team, excuse me. And uh, we had a parents meeting for the parents of the dads on the team. And the kids are out messing around after practice. And I was meeting the parents and they're talking to me, the coach. And I met this one guy and he asked me the question that is always interesting when you're a pastor and you get asked, so what do you do? And I told him that I was a pastor. And he looked rather stunned for a moment. And then he asked where and I told him. And then we got to talking and I said, you know, you ought to come by sometime and check out the church. We'd love to have you anytime. He paused and he said, I don't think so. I'm not much of a church guy. I said, why is that? And his exact words were, I've never forgotten them. He said, I've got enough judgment in my life. Hmm. His first reaction for why he didn't want to go to church was, I'm going to be judged there. Interesting. In her book, Confronting Christianity, author Rebecca McLaughlin tackles some of the biggest objections to the Christian faith and to the Christian church. And at the top of her list, and almost every list, every time there's a cultural research or study or survey done, right at the top of the list of the reasons why people do, are not, reject Christianity or avoid the church is that Christians are too hypocritical and too judgmental. I don't want to come to church because I'm afraid I'm going to be judged. I frequently hear people who are not believers, they're, they don't, they're not Jesus followers, quote or misquote the Bible, say things like, doesn't the Bible say don't judge? I mean, you Christians shouldn't be judging. Is this true? Did God say that? Christians should never judge. Is that true? Is that something that God said? Is that something that we should live by? Actually, the passage most often quoted, even by those who have no idea where to find it in the Bible, is a single verse in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, very simple little verse. We're going to read it and anchor our, our discussion in this passage. Judge not that you be not judged, period. Sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Don't judge. Don't be judgmental. It's right there. What's so hard about that, you Christians? Don't judge. Stop judging. Stop telling people they're wrong. Stop being so intolerant. Stop calling out sin. Just mind your own business and stop judging. I think this verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, may be one of the most misapplied verses or misunderstood verses in all of the Bible. Ironically, those who say in our culture, and there are many who say, you should never judge someone else, are themselves, if you think about it, being judgmental. It is wrong to judge. Well, who are you to judge that it's wrong to judge? I mean, it's passing judgment to say you should not judge. So it doesn't even work that that argument. And quite frankly, the cancel culture that's so intense right now in American society may be the most judgmental cultural force we've ever seen. Harsh judgment, excommunication, culturally speaking, for anyone who does not, is not enlightened enough, does not uh, say the right things, is ignorant or deemed intolerant, or those who simply post or tweet or say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Not only are they called out for that statement they made, but everything they've ever said or done is called into question. Okay, let's get back to Jesus. That's always a good place to go. Let's get back to Jesus. What does he really mean when he tells us not to judge? What's he really saying here? 
Well, in order to understand this, let's read the rest of the passage because one of the mistakes, it's so common, is to lift a verse out of the Bible, slap it on Instagram or Twitter, and say, and say whatever you think it means. Context always matters. And so let's see what Jesus is saying if we read the rest of that passage. This, by the way, Matthew 7, is the last of three chapters we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the, the best of Jesus' teaching on what it means to live life in the kingdom. So let's read the whole passage. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay. Wow. Wow. Context matters. There's a lot more going on here. We also need to ask, not just what the context is, but what the word means, the word judge. Now, when, in, when we say the word judge, if I just use the word judge, most people have images in their mind. And for many of us, it's images of somebody in a black robe sitting behind a wood bench with a gavel in their hand, passing judgment or handing down a sentence. Is that what we're talking about here? The Greek word used here is the word krino. And like English words, it has a range of meanings. Uh, scholars call this the lexical range of a word. It could mean different things in different contexts. So on one end of the lexical range of the word crino, it means simply to make an evaluation, to distinguish between. As if you, like when you say, I didn't judge the distance very well. I didn't make it, that distinction very well. I didn't judge that correctly. On the other end of the lexical range, we have to pass the sentence punish, or condemn. It's a broad range, isn't it? So what's Jesus really talking about here? Is Jesus really forbidding us to practice discernment, to never make an evaluation or a distinction, or never call anything called truth from error or right from wrong? No, of course not. Of course he doesn't mean that. For example, later in the same chapter, chapter 7, just a few verses later, in verses 15 through 20, he says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ra are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits." How do you tell an apple tree from a pear tree? By the fruit. Pears don't grow on apple trees. And apples don't grow on orange trees. Jesus is saying something that sounds obvious, but it's so profound. You will know them by their fruit. What's he saying? This is how you distinguish. Judge. Make discernments. So context matters. Recognize them by the fruit. He's calling us to be discerning. There are so many passages in the Bible that instruct us to be wise judges, discerning followers of Jesus. The question is not, should you judge? The question is, what kind of judge should you be? We all make judgments. We must, if we're to follow Jesus in this world. But what kind of judges should we be? This is what Jesus is really getting at. The other end of the lexical range of the meaning of the word crino to pass judgment, to pass sentence, to condemn. This is what he's warning us against. When we set ourselves up as judge, jury, and executioner, we're outside of what God wants for us in living life in his kingdom. And the difference really is primarily an attitude of the heart. In Romans chapter 14, the apostle Paul says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you look down on him? Ah, now we're understanding what he's really talking about. What's the purpose of your judgment? What, why are you making this discerning distinction in someone's action? Is it judging to restore or judging to destroy? Are you trying to help someone? Do you want the best for them? Are you pointing out something that not only displeases God, but is hurting their soul, damaging their life, and hurting others because you deeply love them and you want something better for them? Or do you think they need to get theirs? Are you sick of the wicked winning and you think they just need to be put in their place? They need to get what's coming to them. 
Judgment to punish, to cause pain, to teach a lesson, to get rid of someone has no place in the life of a Christ follower. Judgment to punish, to condemn, to cause pain, to get rid of, to dismiss has no place in the life of a Jesus follower. The relational context also matters. It also matters who you're talking to and what is the relationship you have with this person. The Apostle Paul talks about this in a profound passage that's almost never referred to in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's talking to the Corinthian church about sexual immorality. He says in verse 9 of chapter 5, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Hear what he's saying? If you're going to avoid every evil or sinful person in the world, you have to move to Mars. And even then you couldn't because you'd be there. But he goes on. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. This is amazing. Paul's saying there's a difference between how you speak to somebody outside the family of God and someone inside. Here's his point. If you're talking to somebody who professes faith in Jesus Christ and says they want to live according to the will of God, yet are ignoring it willfully to their own harm and to the harm of others, eventually there needs to come a breaking point in that relationship. But if you're talking to somebody outside the family of God who does not recognize the Bible as authority over their life, who are you to judge them? That's God's business. We're to love them, to preach the truth to them, to share Christ with them, but not to judge them. So it matters who you're talking to in the context. I'll give you a, a, an example from my own family when my kids were younger. Uh, my oldest son was uh, Noah, was a rule following young man, and he's on the playground in first grade at recess, and we had taught our kids not to take the Lord's name in vain. You know what we mean by that. And so he's on the playground, and he hears little boys saying things that he's taught not to say, using the Lord's name, and he's telling them that they're wrong. <laughs> he's saying, you shouldn't say that. And they're like, why? It's a bad word. No, it's not, because they were taught different words were bad words, and they're getting in these debates. Now, my son is a very good debater, and can you see him in first grade? It's a bad word. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And they're getting into these arguments, and he we're hearing about it at home. I'm trying to explain to him, Noah, that's right. We live by a different value system and code by, according to God's word. Some of those kids may not. And so pray for them, but don't try to uh, be the, uh, the language police at recess. <laughs> it's not your job. Some of us never grow out of that. Some of us are still doing that. Okay, let's talk about how we are to judge. How should we approach those who are turning uh, or thinking or living wrong? Those who are in some way co living contrary to the word and the will of God. This is where Jesus' teaching is so brilliant. The metaphor is so beautiful and so powerful and really so humorous. Let me read to you again verses 3 through 5 of Matthew chapter 7. Just to refresh your memory because it's so important. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, there's so, so much in here. There's just so much for us in here. When you have something in your eye, we all know what that's like. You get a little piece of dust or a little speck or something in your eye. It's incredibly, it's a small thing, but it's irritating, isn't it? I mean, it's a real thing, and it hurts, and your eyes water, and you can't see, and you blink, and you rub, and you can't get it out, and you're trying, and, it's, and you don't want something coming near your eye. You need help there. Jesus is using this metaphor to say, sin gets lodged in our hearts like a speck of dust gets lodged in your eye. And when it does, you can't see clearly. Your vision is distorted. You don't see people accurately. You don't see the world accurately because you've got something lodged in here and you can't get it out. You need help. Let me give you an example. I've talked to people who have been so deeply hurt in a relationship in the past that they, can't, they, they see every relationship through those lenses. It's all they can see. They distrust and they can't help it. They don't even recognize they're doing it, but they see everyone through the lens of those who deeply wounded them. I've talked to people who have this view of the church. They've been, and it breaks my heart. 
They've been wounded, beat up, mistreated in the church. And they're so nervous about trusting a pastor or a church or a congregation again. They can't see clearly. There's so many things that get lodged in us that cause us that distort our vision. So here's a question. Can you truly love someone if you never disagree with them or confront them? Can you truly love someone if you never, ever point anything out to them? No, of course not. That's not loving. Our culture says it is. It's not even tolerant. It's not, it's, it's not any way that we should be behaving. Ask yourself this. Where would you be in your life if no one had ever confronted you, if no one had ever challenged your thinking, if no one had ever pointed out that, that, you, that you might be off base here, if no one had ever called you out in some area of behavior, thought, speech, or action that was out of line, where would you be? What kind of man or woman would you be today if no one had ever pointed anything out to you? It's a scary thought for me. I have never liked it in the moment, but I've always been grateful for it, and God has used it in my life so many times. Faithful people who love Jesus and love me, who gently, lovingly, at risk to themselves, called me out. Question, can you faithfully follow Jesus if you never discern truth from error or good from evil? Can you follow Jesus in the world if you never take a minute and say, is this right, what I'm seeing on social media? Is this truthful? Is this accurate? No, you can't. We must be wise judges for each other's sake and for our own sake in the world. We need people to be spiritually discerning and willing to challenge and confront us. This is the lesson of the speck. We all have specks in our eye, things that distort our vision, that are causing us pain. But how do you take a speck out of your, someone's eye? You ever get something in your eye and you can't get it out and you need help? How do you want someone to come and take it out of your eye? Very carefully, right? If you said, I got something in my eye and I can't see, could you help me? And they grab the screwdriver and a pair of pliers and I got you. You'd be like, whoa, no, 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 wait, no. Right, that's not how we do it. Not, not even tweezers, but a tissue. Gently, gently, carefully. Isn't the image really tender and beautiful that Jesus is using here? It's so profound. This is how we're to treat each other and approach each other. He's so wise, and he shows us how not to go about this. Notice how he says, there's something you must do first before you're fit and ready to help a brother or sister with, what's, with their issue. You have some work to do first. What's that work? And he gives us this really profound metaphor. And what he's really saying here, are you the kind of person who your sins loom larger to you than other person's sins? Do you see your issues as a bigger deal than other people's issues? Or is it the other way around? And he's really rather humorous here. He uses the image of the speck and the log, right? So this is not a speck, but so that you can see it. We'll just, probably about half that size. We'll use a little splinter here. Just a little splinter, a little tiny splinter, right? And I got this log in my eye, and I'm walking around going, man, you got to deal with this, dude. This is a problem. I mean, everybody sees this. This is not good. I mean, you, you really got to get a handle on this thing because it's embarrassing, and we're all trying to tell you about it, and you just won't see it. I mean, I see it. They see it. We all see it, but you don't see this, and you've got to deal with this. It's ridiculous, right? It's humorous, and this is, a, I don't want to get too close to my eye. I might get a speck in my eye. It's, Jesus is being funny here, but he's also being very, very profound to us because how should your sin look to you? If you have a speck in your eye, it should feel like a log to you. It should be a big deal to you. It should be something you want to deal with and need help dealing with. But so many of us are doing just that. We're looking over here. And we're walking around and everyone else sees it, but we don't. Now, Jesus is saying, that here's the primary point. Until you see your own sin accurately and begin to deal with it honestly, you will not, you're not going to be able to help anybody see and deal with theirs. Until you see your own sin accurately and deal with it honestly, you're not fit, you're not ready, you're not going to be helpful to someone else dealing with theirs. That's his primary point. If you want to help someone, the other people. Notice he says, first, 
Take the speck out of your eye. He calls us hypocrites. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye. Then you will see clearly to help your brother or sister. Now here's what this does not mean, which I think many of us think it means. It doesn't mean I can never talk to anybody about their sin or their issue or their, or their brokenness un- until I get my life totally under control, unless I have all my issues resolved. That is not what Jesus is saying. If that were the case, no one would ever confront anyone and we'd all be in trouble. He's saying if you're ignoring major issues in your life and you won't face them and you won't deal with them and you won't begin to work on them, then you're not ready to help somebody else. You can't be a help to them, but they need your help. And here's the beautiful way this works. When you see some, a, a speck in someone else's eye, their issue, it should, it should, I should see that and go, oh, I, I want to help them, but I also want to look at my own life. I also want to examine my own heart. So their issues should help me recognize my issues. One of the reasons I get most offensive or I should say the things I get most defensive about, is when I recognize someone else's sin in me. I don't always acknowledge this, but I get fired up when somebody behaves in ways that I behave. Interesting. I should turn the inwardly and say, God, where do you want to deal with me? So actually, their issue helps, is, is, is God's grace to me to help me deal with mine. But not just for me, so that I'm fit then to bless and help them. Gently, carefully, lovingly, restoratively, not harshly. That's what Jesus is saying. Are you this kind of person? Am I this kind of person? Are we the kind of people, are we the kind of church courageous enough to confront, but humble and gracious and gentle enough to do it in a way that helps? Bold and compassionate, honest and gracious. Some of us tend towards saying, love, 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 just love everyone, but there's not much truth there, which is actually not loving. Others of you, this is not your problem. Truth, 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 like a hammer, but there's not much love there, and nobody listens. Speaking the truth in love, the Bible calls this. It's not easy to do, particularly, I think, in our current cultural moment. Being wise, gracious, discerning judges of our own lives and of the world around us is profoundly difficult. For on the one hand, we live in an individual, uh, rel- individualistic and relativistic society where to call anything wrong is tantamount to hate speech. On the other hand, we live in an internet social media society where people say the most hateful things online without any accountability. It feels like we're caught between either clamming up or blowing up, but nobody's nuanced and kind and gracious. That's what Jesus is calling us to here. That's the kind of judge, judges we should be. In, in John chapter 7, we're told, judge with right judgment. Well, ultimately, we know only Jesus is the perfect judge. And notice that when Jesus in Matthew 7 says, the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What does that mean? Could it be that you're not experiencing the grace of God the way you long to or the way you could because you're not sharing the grace of God the way you should? Could it be that you're not experiencing the forgiveness and mercy and love of God the way you long to and should, could, because you're not giving it the way that you should? The way, the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. There's a spiritual principle here. And we, the Bible calls this speaking the truth in love. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, talks about growing up into spiritual maturity. That we would grow up. And in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he, he's talking about what this looks like for us to grow up into spiritual maturity. And I'll read to you just verses 14 and 15. He says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Learning to be spiritually discerning, wise, courageous, compassionate, humble, loving, gentle, truthful, even toward those you completely disagree with. Primarily, especially toward those you completely disagree with. 
I'm reading a book right now by Scott Sauls called A Gentle Answer from the book of Proverbs uh, with a phrase in Proverbs 15 says, A Gentle Answer Turns Away Wrath. And his whole premise is perhaps the most countercultural, radical thing we could do is to be gentle in the world. Not cowardly, not clamming up and never speaking the truth, but doing it with gentleness, with compassion, with kindness. Because no one is doing that. I don't have to tell you, it's election season. No one is, say, is acting that way. But we should. We should. And that's what Jesus is saying to us here. That's how Jesus comes to us. He speaks the truth about us. You've got some logs in your eye. You've got issues. But he does it in love. He does it to restore. He does it to redeem. He does it to forgive. So, Chapel Street Church and all who are tuning in from wherever you are, what if, what if we really became men and women who were courageous and bold and committed to the truth and wise and discerning as we looked out into the world, into our own hearts, into the lives of others, and yet, and yet at the same time, humble, gentle, gracious, and kind? What would that be like? The world desperately needs people like that. I need to be a person like that. And that's precisely who Jesus is and who he wants us to be. Let's pray. Father God, you have told us not to judge in terms of condemnation and passing sentence, but you call us to be wise and discerning and gentle in the world. Because Jesus, that's how you are in this world. You are gentle and lowly in heart. You have all power and all authority and all knowledge and yet you're the most humble, gracious man who ever walked the planet. We fall far short of that. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for being fixated on the speck in someone else's eye when we ignore the log of sin in our own eye. Help us by your grace to deal with, this, with our own issues, not just for our sake, but that we might be the kind of wise, discerning, gentle judges the world needs. Thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.